Which pain was worse, the heart attack or the heartbreak? All of Brad Carson's friends thought he was living a charmed life. His business was profitable and his employees considered themselves lucky to work with him. His gorgeous wife was intelligent, happy, socially beloved, and devoted to her husband. They were proud of their three children, two of whom had already graduated from university. All were healthy and woke up every morning with anticipation. Brad's main love was his wife, Molly. She was a tall, dark-haired beauty with a smile that didn't escape the sun. But it was when the sun was setting and the lights were dimmed that Brad truly recognized Molly's beauty. Even though her driver's license said she was 50 years old, her body said no thanks to aging. Despite having three children, her breasts, with silicone lift, were impressive. They could be viewed, fondled, and kissed. They met at a charity event at the hospital where they were raising money for a new pediatric wing. Brad accompanied his mother to the event because his father had unexpectedly left for a meeting with an out-of-town client. His father, Carl, opened a small mechanic shop after he retired from the army at the end of the Korean War. Brad wanted to be an engineer like his father, so he majored in mechanical engineering at the University of Florida, located near his home in Tampa. Brad wouldn't go, but his mother really wanted to go, but didn't want to be anyone's third extra. They were seated at a table of eight, half a verse away from the group. Molly and her companions sat at the same table. She was a nurse at Mercy Hospital, and he was a medical salesman. She had dreamed for years of putting on an evening gown, drinking champagne, and attending this elite gala. All the doctors and rich businessmen were there. She wanted to be there, among the beautiful people. By accepting the salesman's offer, she was able to attend this exclusive event. The salesman thought he was going to win the lottery that night, getting a stunning woman for a date and with a free open bar. Molly wasn't interested in him groping her while she danced, so his attention turned to the bar. As her companion sipped his fourth or fifth scotch, Molly looked across the table and whispered softly to Brad, Please dance with me. Brad's mother noticed Molly's position as well, nudged him under the ribs with her elbow, and winked as if to say, Come on! Brad was on his feet in a flash and held out his hand to Molly. Brad, I'm so grateful to you for saving me. I knew I shouldn't have met him, but I dreamed of going to this event. It's every girl's dream to dance the night away with a charming man at an event like this. I hope you don't mind dancing with me. Smiling, Brad replied, I'm happy to help you make your evening memorable. I hope to play the role of Prince Charming for you this evening. If you have a good time tonight, would you agree to go out with me Saturday night? She raised an eyebrow and said, I don't have a date right now, but I'd be willing if the right guy would take me out for a nice dinner and maybe a dance. I may not be the right guy, but I'd really like to take you out to dinner and dancing. They did a few fast and slow dances together, and then decided to go back to the table and have a drink. The drunken salesman mumbled something about going to the bathroom, but never returned. Brad's mother said, I think he's gone for the evening. Some of my neighbors are already here and ready to go home, so I'll give them a ride home. Brad, I trust you'll get that pretty nurse home on time. With a wide smile, he replied, Yes, Mom. Then he winked at Molly and she laughed again. Molly spent the rest of the evening at the table of her fellow nurses. The girls took great pleasure in the fact that Molly had traded her unsuccessful beau for a handsome local businessman. So began their relationship, which evolved into kissing, petting, and making love on Saturday nights. Brad couldn't believe his luck. Not only was she fun and smart, but she had everything he wanted to see in his life partner. Like the Ferrari, her body was impressive and her performance was world-class. She wasn't a virgin, but she wasn't a whore either, and she wasn't flipping on players all over town. Eventually, it was time to meet the parents. Molly had already met Brad's mother. His father only glanced at her, and there was a sparkle in his eyes as she hugged him. Two years after graduation and a year of courting Molly, they were married in Molly's hometown of Fort Lauderdale. Two years later, they had a son, Jonathan, then a daughter, Carrie, and finally a second son, Matthew. Thirty years after Brad graduated, Carl was ready for retirement. Brad was promoted to president of Southeast Manufacturing, a company that specialized in manufacturing for the aerospace industry. Upon his father's retirement, Brad received all the stock in the company in exchange for his father, receiving a monthly consultant fee for the rest of his and his wife's lives. Jonathan, with a degree in mechanical engineering, now had the opportunity to become the next president, third generation, of the family business in 20, 30 years. Molly worked at the hospital until she had two children. 
She waited until the youngest, Matthew, could find his own way home from school before returning to her nursing job. When her first two children were in college and only Matthew stayed home, she decided she didn't like the hours the hospital required. She retired but did not lose interest in nursing or hospital work. Because of Brad's status in the business community and generous donations to the hospital, Molly was asked to serve on a number of hospital committees. She loved being close to the hospital and longtime friends who still worked there. Here it was, the American dream. A wife with whom he enjoyed every moment, three wonderful children, a dream home for his wife, financial success, and good health for everyone in the family. That was until Brad and Molly stopped by to play bridge with their neighbors, Ken and Brenda. Brenda and Molly had worked the same shift as nurses when they were new employees at the hospital and remained friends. Ken was a general practitioner, which allowed Brenda to retire about the same time as Molly. Brad was getting lucky at cards, but he didn't notice the growing pain in his chest until he'd lost four hands. Suddenly, he was confused about which card to play. The stress of working in the office had finished him, he thought. As he reached for the glass in front of him, he felt a growing pain in his chest. He opened his mouth to say something to Ken, but the words wouldn't come. Ken quickly noticed the problem and walked over to Brad to lend a hand. Now he was being touched and asked questions. He heard Brenda yell into her cell phone, Heart attack at 1948 Pine Pole Lane. We need an ambulance right away. Brad looked around and thought, Who's having a heart attack? It's just the four of us. Someone is really sick and I hope the ambulance gets here soon. He looked up from the floor and saw the other three kneeling around him and immediately felt an even heavier weight on his chest. Oh, damn. This is me. Molly, Molly, where are you? I'm here, honey. Just calm down. The ambulance is on its way. Ken called the best cardiologist in town to meet us. For the entire next week, Brad felt fuzzy. He knew where he was and why. One thing that was always there for him was Molly. She checked in every time someone wrote in his chart and amazingly understood what was written. She was the perfect patient advocate. The final result of the medical exam revealed that Brad had suffered a massive heart attack. Had it not been for the three medical experts he had been playing cards with that evening, they would have already lowered him into eternal rest. Quick action, as well as triple bypass surgery, brought him the promise of a long and healthy life, provided he changed his lifestyle. Molly became the captain of the slave ship, which became Brad's new way of life. Plenty of rest, no emotional stress, slow walks around the neighborhood, and no strenuous physical activity. His nurse and wife held his hand as they explained the last item on Brad's you-should-not list for a full recovery. Honey, we're both going to have to change our sex life for a few months. I'm going to miss that energy and physical strength. We will have to be very gentle in our caresses, but only for a few months. Until then, we will be limited to being gentle and loving carcasses. I love you deeply and will be by your side as we overcome this challenge. Brad knew what the rules would be. He had friends and business associates with the same diagnosis. He didn't like it, but the alternative was to give up sex forever in a lonely box deep in the ground. It wasn't a hard choice to make. For the first four months, Brad was the perfect patient. No griping, whining, or breaking any rules. Molly played a positive role in recreating a healthy, happy Brad. His only thought was, how is Molly coping with her celibacy? She always had a vibrator, her husband's traveling companion. They even played with it together when they were in the mood. From the time of their courtship until their 30th anniversary, they were vigorous and very physical lovers. It was not uncommon for both of them to be drenched in sweat from the erotic heat. Brad considered it one of his blessings, a beautiful, insatiable wife. How does she cope with his current physical infirmity? Molly was growing weary of what she thought was slow physical progress, even though it was ahead of the doctor's expected recovery time. By day, she was bright and happy around Brad. Despite the lack of intercourse, their tender care for each other continued. Molly tried to determine how much he could do by Brad's blood pressure and heart rate. He started walking slowly and eventually walked a mile each day. The goal was to get his heart muscles to work a little harder each week. According to the cardiologist, this would allow him to have an easy sex life. By the beginning of the fourth month after the attack, Brad had recovered enough to start enjoying some sexual activity. Although it contributed to Brad's recovery, neither of them liked the lack of spontaneity and intimacy with all those wires and monitors hooked up to him. Brad nicknamed this process Frankenstein sex. 
When she turned off the monitor, she would turn to him and lovingly say, Someday, baby, someday soon. As Brad's condition improved, she was able to leave him alone to run errands and resume the social activities she enjoyed. One morning after a sound sleep, Brad heard the phone ring one morning and Molly answered, Hi, Carrie. Brad was amused by this, for he enjoyed talking to his lively, vivacious, free-spirited daughter. He shuffled down the hall and approached Molly while she was talking. He heard Molly say, Oh yes, your father is getting better every day. At least that's what the doctors who see him weekly say. I don't see him as often, but he's much better than when we took him home. There was silence in the room until Molly began again. Yes, my therapist is working very well. I'm very pleased with the results. Of course, he's nowhere near as much of a lover as your father. Or was and probably soon will be. No one has rocked my world like your father. For that reason, I told Eric that this is temporary and I will no longer need his services when Brad returns to full strength. Muffled sounds from the phone and then, Yeah, I know he won't be able to do me as well as he used to, but it'll take some time to rebuild his stamina. So yeah, I'll probably have Eric work on call instead of the usual twice a week. Yes, twice a week, dear. It's still less than what I'm used to. Well, I'd say the most interesting part was when he had me on the examination table like a gynecologist. You know what he did next? No, dear. Absolutely not. Never, never, never do this to your husband while he's able to do his job. I'll drop Eric like a hot potato as soon as Brad can make me feel good. At this point, Brad couldn't stand in the hallway. He had to sit down before he fell over. The love of his life was having fun with another man. How could she? Am I really that withdrawable? His head was spinning, almost as badly as it had during a heart attack. In desperation, he began to do the breathing exercise the doctor had told him to do when he was stressed. Molly heard Brad stumble to a chair and, dropping the phone, rushed as quickly as she could to the pale Brad. She held him down so he wouldn't fall to the floor. He was diligently breathing large, steady, regular portions of oxygen. He would take a big breath in, and as he exhaled, he would look at Molly, saying, Cheater. Inhale, exhale, cheater. Inhale, exhale, cheater. In a panic, she cut off phone service to Carrie and dialed 911 to call an ambulance. Medics loaded him into the car and gave him oxygen. Molly tried to climb into the back of the car, but judging by his violent reaction to that, the medics told her to go to the hospital herself. At the hospital, the same thing happened. Molly was not allowed into the room. It was several hours before Brad's doctor came out to see Molly. Molly, who was nearly biting her fingernails off, blaming herself for causing another heart attack, Molly, the doctor said, he's stable now. It wasn't a heart attack that caused this reaction. It was some kind of emotional stress. In his weakened state, the stress was too much and he passed out. Whatever it was, it has to do with you. He absolutely does not want you in his room this afternoon. We'll see how he behaves tomorrow. I fully expect him to be discharged tomorrow. Please go home and get some rest before you become my next patient. She staggered back to her car with a sad puppy dog expression on her face. What had caused that reaction? Then it hit her. He must have heard her conversation with Carrie about her substituting sex with Eric. She hoped that her adventures with the therapist would remain a secret. After all, their sex was just between the two of them. No one else but Carrie was involved, of course. No wonder he fainted. She realized that her husband trusted her completely. He never asked her any questions that might lead him to think she was lying or cheating on him. He appeared unprepared to hear a conversation with Carrie about her lover Eric. A few years ago, before she left for a month in Europe, he had teased her about missing her beloved husband. She only laughed it off, saying, Start your cardio workout before I leave, because when I get back I'm going to ride you for days on end. Fortunately, upon her return, she didn't have to lie to him about the Italian men she'd entertained that month. She didn't lie, but he never asked either. That was also the plan for the duration of his disability. The next morning, his buddy, Dr. Ken, came to check on Brad. Ken talked to the emergency room doctor and decided he needed to be there for Brad. Hey, Brad, you gave us a scare yesterday. I'm glad your heart wasn't the main culprit, but the stress you were under could lead to another heart attack. Would you like me to prescribe you some depressants to help you calm down and not be so agitated? No, Ken. It wasn't so much the event itself that bothered me but the fact that it came out of nowhere. Now I know what my hitherto undiscovered problem is. I think I can deal with it. However, I appreciate your thoughts, and I may need to consult with you later. Okay? 
Sure, Brad. No problem. I'm heading back to my office. Do you need a ride home or is Molly coming over? He said, No, Molly is not coming to take me to my house. This was said with more vehemence than Ken expected. His doctor friend began to diagnose that the source of Brad's stress attack was related to Molly. On the way home, Ken was careful not to broach topics that might cause Brad stress. He helped Brad into the house and sat him on the couch in the family room. He was surprised that Molly wasn't there with her husband. Brad didn't mind spending a few hours alone before meeting with his wife. He wrote down a few points he wanted to convey to her. He would get to the heart of the problem in a few days. First, he wanted to rest, not jump into the blazing dumpster he knew was not far off. When Molly arrived, she dropped the groceries and ran to Brad. The hurt look in his eyes and the obvious pain on his face stopped her like a fast-running dog caught at the end of a long leash. Brad, I'm sorry. I... Shut up. I don't want to talk about what you discussed with Carrie. I need to rest, clear my head, and calm down. But Brad... Shut up. Did I not make myself clear to you, or are you trying to kill me? No, Brad. I'm just so happy to have you back in our home. I want to live a long life with you. I can't live without you. If you love me so much, please get me a glass of water. I also need to get this horrible hospital food out of my bowels. Please make me dinner since it's 6 p.m. It was a very quiet evening as Molly walked the tightrope, trying not to mention her obvious infidelity in conversations with her obviously distraught husband. After two hours of watching two NFL teams playing uninteresting soccer, he went to bed. For the first time in his memory, he went to bed without kissing Molly goodnight. He made his way to the master bedroom and turned off all the alarm clocks, figuring he'd get some sleep that way. After a while, he felt his wife, naked, slide into bed. She pressed her lush breasts against his back and wrapped her arms around him. Don't, was all he said to get her to stop any touching of his skin. He was already having trouble falling asleep without the bed rocking as she sobbed softly. He thought, if she doesn't like the new arrangement, she can go to the guest room. Two days later, he said, let's talk after breakfast. Is that okay with you? After putting away their hearty dinner, she sat on the edge of the kitchen table, waiting for the worst conversation of her life. Brad silently entered the room, sat across from her at the table, and placed the clipboard and pen on the table. Molly, I want you to tell me in your own words what's going on in regards to what I heard from your phone conversation with Carrie. I've only heard one side of it, and it sounds like you've been cheating on me for some time now. Now I want to hear the whole story from beginning to end. Do you understand what I want to hear? Muttering a yes so quietly he barely heard her. Something else, Molly. We are on a precipice over a huge chasm. Our marriage could be fixed or destroyed depending on what you tell me. Truth is as important to me as fidelity. Don't try to lie or omit important points thinking you're saving me or protecting me. If I find out you are lying or hiding facts about your behavior... I will begin divorce proceedings immediately. Do you understand? Yes. I will now allow you to recount what has happened, and I will not interrupt you. This is your one and only moment to lay everything out to determine where we go from here. This clipboard is needed so that I can write down my questions after you have finished. Now it's your turn to speak. Brad, I'm sorry you had to hear part of my conversation with Carrie. Your reaction is understandable. What makes it worse is that it happened at a time when you were recovering so well. He thought, that's a lie, judging by what she said to Carrie earlier. She sounds like a suck-up, from your heart attack. Thank you for not throwing me out on the street, but allowing me to explain my position. That's why I love you so much. My story started three years ago when I was playing tennis a lot. I was suffering from sprained muscles and ligaments. I was sitting on the sideline and almost crying from the pain and inability to play properly, when a man about 10 years younger than me asked if I was okay. I explained my problem and he said he was a physical therapist and might be able to help me. At first I thought he was a jerk and just wanted to rub my butt and feet. He gave me his business card and said we could go to the first aid tent and he could work on me in front of the EMTs. Molly continued. After about a half hour, my back felt a hundred times better and I was able to finish the tournament. He has an office south of Tampa and I've gone to see him several times since then to keep my back from failing. We never had anything close to sex. It was always a professional doctor-patient relationship. I enjoyed his company, but I never even kissed or hugged him. Everything changed after your heart attack, Brad. 
You were so close to death. I didn't know what I was going to do without you. I didn't know what I would do without you. We've always had a physically challenging sexual relationship. I've never had such great sex in my life. We're in our 50s and I think we're still on our honeymoon. You created for me a certain expectation of outstanding sex every week. Now it's on hold while you recover. During the therapy session, he noticed how tense all my muscles were and they needed attention. I told him about your condition and how I missed making love to you. He stepped away from me, opened a drawer and showed me a pamphlet called Sex and Physical Therapy. He said that my problem was not that unusual, especially in couples who are sexually active. He told me to take the book home, study it, and come back to the office if I wanted to use this form of sexual release. The book begins with stages of action. First, there was just hugging and touching. The next few chapters discussed sexual intercourse between the physical therapist and the patient. I wasn't interested in that, so I didn't even bother to read them. At the next meeting, I asked that he use his skillful hands. He agreed, but it didn't have to be slam bam, thanks, Mom. We spent an hour of low light, quiet music, cuddling and kissing before something more happened. After that, I was just a puddle and we lay together, dozing and cuddling like long-lost lovers. This activity began several months ago while you were still in the hospital. I know you don't want to hear this, Brad, but you said you wanted to know everything. Although it sounds like the most erotic thing I've ever done, it wasn't. I cried all the way to the car. I didn't love him, he was just a talented guy. I cried because I wanted you to be the one to make me relax like you used to. Over the next few weeks, we moved on to actual intercourse. He wasn't as big or as skillful or as loving as you, and I told him so. He said it wasn't a competition for me, but to keep my libido alive so I could come back to you, tuned up like a Ferrari, ready for my main driver to rock my world. He said he would gladly let me go so he could come back to love you. It was just working with another patient. In fact, he made me sign a slip each time that I had a procedure that day. That's what he called it, a treatment. Brad, this was supposed to be temporary until you got better. I didn't want my sex drive to leave me because I want you and only you with me. I don't want to be one of those middle-aged wives who no longer want sex with their man. I want to keep rocking and rolling with you, baby. I apologize to you and will answer all your questions. Brad already had a list of items ready, but now he had a million or two more. First of all, Molly, who is this guy? I see no need to give you his name as the whole disgrace lies with me, not him. Okay, Molly, I think we're done here. I have just enough time to get to the attorney's office and start the paperwork. As he was about to leave, she jumped up and shouted, This is Eric, Eric Adams from Bradenton, Florida. Molly, you said you wanted to be sexually customized all the time, like a Ferrari. Did it ever occur to you that your Ferrari could be driven out of a nice garage and left in a dark alley? No, because no one knew what I was doing. We took a lot of precautions. I wanted to be able to answer you like I did last year and without this mess I made. How many people know you're a cuckold? There was no cuckolding. I always respected you and looked forward to your return to our bed. That's bullshit. When a married woman has fun with someone other than her husband, you are committing the most hurtful part of disrespecting your husband. Cuckolding is a simple word that is the worst thing you can do to your husband. No real man would ever publicly agree to voluntarily accept this label because it makes him seem less than a man. Now, how many people know about this procedure that fooled me? Just me and Eric. Then what were you talking to Carrie about? Time to catch another liar. Oh yes, Carrie and I discussed it at length before I started the more intimate treatment. She decided it was a good idea and you wouldn't have a problem with it. She reminded me that I am the master of my body. I should be able to make all the decisions about what I do with this body. She supported the decision I made. Later, she called me and told me that her brothers also thought it would be good for both of us in the long run. So the cuckold support group has grown from you and Eric to our three kids. That's five and Jonathan and Carrie told their spouses? I guess that's seven now. Molly could only shrug at his remark. She asked, Can I give you an analogy for our situation that I read in the booklet? It's a story about a soccer player in the NFL. He was the best running back on the team until he suffered an injury that didn't end his season, but he will miss four games. The number two player comes to the team and plays well, but when number one is ready, he replaces number two. 
Number one doesn't hate number two for filling in for him. It's part of life. I think there are some similarities there. Interesting story. The difference is that the NFL contract with both players allows for replacement for both injury and performance. A team can also cut any player at any time for any reason. Our contract clearly states that there will be no substitutions for any reason at any time. That's about all I have for questions today. You can't believe how tired I am. Maybe it's just the sheer frustration of how my life is being ruined. This isn't over, we need to talk some more. I just don't have the energy to get into it enough to understand the future. Molly rushed to him, crying and saying, I'm so sorry this is happening to you. I promise to make it all right. I love you so much. To emphasize her point, she threw her arms around his neck and tried to kiss him. Get your filthy, drooling lips off me. You need to get tested for STDs before you get within six feet of me again. The sooner the better. Oh, Brad, I can't do that. I know all the nurses at the health center. I'd be humiliated if I came in and asked for a test. How humiliating that would be. You mean it's more humiliating than having fun with some asshole and telling my kids about my inferiority. Yes, I'm very sorry for you and your reputation. More sorry than you are for my humiliation. I need fresh air. It stinks in here. I'm going outside, so leave me alone, Molly. While Brad went to the backyard, Molly sobbed at the table. Since it was a warm morning, Brad took advantage of the hammock in the shade to take a nap. He'd learned a lot from his conversation with Molly, but he wasn't happy about it. Then he wondered what else he didn't know. Although sleep wasn't refreshing, it was better than discussing how Molly spent her free time. He rolled out of the hammock and headed inside for a drink of water. He would have preferred a nice light beer after dinner, but that was out of the question. On his way to the bathroom, he didn't notice that Molly had just finished showering and was drying herself off. She was standing naked in the middle of the bathroom, vigorously wiping her hair. The towel covered her face, and she didn't notice Brad enter the room. Brad stopped abruptly, seeing his wife naked for the first time in weeks. He knew this was the most beautiful woman he had ever seen, let alone loved. He couldn't help but smile looking at such a beautiful body. Molly just removed the towel from her face and saw a smiling Brad. Their gazes met and lingered on each other. Until Brad saw it, he gasped, concentrating his vision. There they were, the love bites on the inside of her thighs. What the hell? Molly, he's tagging you. He's sending me messages that you belong to him, not me. Now you come first for him and I come second. How could you do this to me? How? And why? Brad, don't you realize? This is all because of you. I only had sex with Eric because I couldn't have sex with you. Eric knows that. We're not lovers. He's just supporting me so I can be the wife you're used to. I'm doing this for you, for us, so we can go back to the way things used to be. Every day when I look at you, I want to throw you on the floor and jump on you. I want you to live with me for the next 50 years. To do that, I'm going to have to do the hardest thing I've ever done. Deny myself sex with you. Sex with Eric means nothing to me but exercise, like going to the driving range to hone your stroke. Brad remained silent, preferring to hear everything he needed to understand why his loving wife had betrayed him. He didn't feel like arguing. He didn't have the energy or desire to stand there and yell at each other. Both the heart beating in his chest and the heart of his soul had been traumatized over the past couple days, and he needed rest. A place to think without the hurricane of drama. I'm going to get some rest in the bedroom. Leave me alone. No sooner had he relaxed than his phone informed him of an incoming call from his daughter. Hi, Daddy. I'm glad you didn't have to stay in the hospital that long. Was it just a little flash in the heart? No, honey, it's much worse than that. I found out that my wife was cheating on me. It surprised and infuriated me, so much so that I had an anxiety attack. I'm at a crossroads as to what to do. Oh, Dad, no need to worry. Just forget about it and move on with your life. Mom loves you and having sex with her therapist doesn't make sense. She was totally confused while you were in the hospital. She needed a release or she would have had a heart attack. Didn't you notice how less nervous she was when she was taking care of you the last four months? It was better for both her and you that she could get that sexual release. My friends and I discussed it, and the consensus was that she did the right thing for herself and for you. Most importantly, she is nursing you back to health, and you love each other even more than before. She's not complaining about your heart attack, 
so you shouldn't complain about her needing to be treated with sex. Besides, it's her body and she can do whatever she wants with it. We thought it was almost like polyamory, everything but spousal approval. Mom and Eric had an honest relationship, knowing what each wanted and needed from the other. There was an end point where you regained full power with mom. They had rules, no dating, no dinners, no socializing, no other people, and never ever say I love you. Eric was only there to fill the part of the relationship that was empty in mom's life. She needed that part to remain a complete woman. No one was pushing you out of the way, you just weren't ready for it. Once you were ready, Eric would be gone, just like they planned. And all without damaging your relationship. Carrie, I appreciate your friend's wise advice, just get over it. After six semesters as a psychology major and still without a degree, you are really onto something. What makes you and your friends think you can give advice to a 51-year-old heart attack victim who is being cheated on by his wife on how to adjust to two of the most devastating events in a man's life? What you are telling me is nothing more than verbal vomit. After that, Brad didn't feel like talking to his daughter anymore. Maybe they would talk again in a week or two. Then he hung up. Interrupting his sleep, he called his son Jonathan to ask a few questions about work, something he wasn't allowed to do when Molly was around. At the end of the conversation, he asked his oldest son, Did you know that your mom started having sex with her physical therapist after my heart attack? No, this is the first I've heard of it. I knew she was seeing a therapist regularly, but I didn't know anything about the sex they were having. When did it start and how are you going to end it? Who is this asshole anyway? Didn't you know about this, Dad? No, I just happened to come across it when your mom and Carrie were talking. Your mom said Carrie told you and Matthew about it, and you were cool with it. There's not an ounce of truth in that, Jonathan almost shouted. I'd remember that conversation and kick my sister's ass if she revealed that shit was going on. I know she's hanging out with some whores. I don't know what her husband Tim thinks about it, but I think he and I need to have a talk. I'm very sorry to hear that, Dad. It must be a terrible shock. Please let me know what you need, and I will do my best to help you, whatever it is. Thank you, son. I appreciate it. Have you talked to Matthew lately? Does he know anything about this? We talked about you being in the hospital last night, but nothing like that travesty came up. We just thought it was a relapse. No one told us anything different. Please call your brother and give him the news. I have so much energy left today that I can't talk about this shitstorm anymore. Don't let Carrie or your mother know that you know the real reason for the latest hospitalization. I want to see what other lies will be told and from whom. Jonathan replied, I know this is hard for you, but you need to turn off your anger and relax. Let what will happen happen. You've always been a quick decision maker, but you need to change your style. Relax. Take the time to make rational rather than quick decisions. Keep your heart healthy. Okay? Both men were disappointed by what happened and promised to keep in touch. He couldn't settle down to sleep, so he went to the family room. There he found a note. Going to take an STD test. I don't want to do it, but I'll do anything you ask if you let me stay married to you. Much love, Molly. He sat on the couch and reflected on Jonathan's remarks about taking it easy on his heart. One of the joys of his life was a good cigar on the back patio. Molly hates even the smell of smoke permeating the house when he goes in and out for more alcohol. He thought, she does what she wants to do. And I'll do what I want. With these thoughts, he dusted off the humidor he hadn't opened in five months. His choice was the Liga Privada No. 9. At seven inches long, it should last an hour. Sitting on the bus, he lit the cigar that was at the top of Molly's You Don't Smoke list. Yes, smoking is bad for your health, as is having your wife have fun with someone else. His favorite single malt scotch poured on one finger doesn't hurt either. He turned on Fox Sports Center and distracted himself from the shitstorm surrounding him. It was a relaxing 65 minutes with the stub of his cigar smoldering in the ashtray when Molly walked in the door. What the hell? was her first reaction to the earthy odor of one of mankind's finest smoking blends. Brad, you shouldn't be smoking! Yeah, and you shouldn't be having fun with some jerk. It will ruin the curtains and the carpeting. You won't be able to get the smoke odor out. It will never be the same again. It has to be ripped out and thrown away. He said angrily, You know, Molly, there's real symbolism here. The smoke ruined the rug, so we threw it away. You ruined our marriage, so maybe we should throw it away too. 
Knowing she would be rejected, she couldn't run and hug her husband. He was right, and she had no one to blame but herself. She couldn't find the words to parry his attacks. Instead, she walked over to the couch and sat down, but not next to him, but on the same couch, as close as he would let her be to him. Trying for a change of scenery, she asked. We're invited to the Simpsons tonight for wine and dessert. Sharon has finished renovating her kitchen and wants us to see it. I know it's not something you like to do, but could we leave the house for an hour or two and take a break from the terrible pain I've caused you? Please? Okay, an hour is all I can take from her husband. It would be nice to get out of this house for a while, though. I don't really like Gary either, but Kelly and the Sullivans will be there so you won't be alone with Gary. Their dinner passed in silence until Brad asked about her visit to the clinic. Molly replied, It was humbling. I knew all three nurses. They handled it professionally and didn't judge me, at least to my face. The worst part was having to tell them who I had sex with in the last 90 days. My hand shook violently when I put in Eric's name instead of yours. I'm so ashamed, Brad. I can understand at least a small, very small part of what you're going through. She struggled to get the last word out. Brad didn't say anything, and he didn't need to. Molly happily walked into Gary and Sharon's house. Brad feigned a small fake smile and went into the kitchen to make admiring remarks about it. Gary led Brad into the family room where Paul and Sam were discussing the next Buccaneers soccer game. All three men had already proceeded to select Gary's whiskey, laughing and joking. Gary offered Brad a drink and Brad replied, Sorry, I'll have to stay away from that for a few more months. Thanks for the offer. I forgot about that, Brad. How's the rehab going? Rehab takes time and energy and doesn't allow me to do as much as I want. Smirking, Gary said, Too bad there are things you want to do but can't. By the way, I heard that you let your wife have fun with other guys because of your weak heart. I'd like to put my name on the list of guys she's allowed to have fun with. I'd really like to do her. At those words, Brad's face turned stony and his eyes shot fire at the emotionless jerk. How dare he talk to him like that? Gary noticed the change in mood, smiled quickly and said, Just kidding, pulling your chain. I meant no disrespect to you or Molly. He held out his hand and said, No hard feelings. Brad's face softened, but his heart and anger had not subsided. He took a step toward Gary, extending his right hand. Gary smirked but didn't notice as Brad's left hand took a strong swing and went straight for Gary's balls. His glistening fist delivered a straight punch. As Gary cried out in excruciating pain, Brad took the opportunity and delivered an elbow strike to Gary's jaw. Brad wanted Gary to feel pain every time he thought of Brad Carson or his wife. Gary spun 360 degrees and fell onto the coffee table, scattering glasses, drinks, and snacks everywhere. The three women ran into the room as Sharon exclaimed, What happened? Brad looked directly at Molly and grinned. Gary heard that you're having fun with other men because I can't perform in front of you. He asked me to put him on the list of guys who can entertain you. I gave him my answer. Molly's face poured blood. Oh no, was all she could say, but she repeated it over and over again. She turned to Sharon and screamed, You weren't supposed to tell anyone. No one. You weren't supposed to tell anyone. Molly turned to Brad, but he was gone. She didn't even hear the door slam shut over Gary's groan. Molly saw only Brad's taillights as she rushed outside to talk to him. Oh shit, he's gone, was her first thought. Then she shuddered as she thought of the other, broader meaning of he's gone. Forever? The breathing exercises he did to reduce his stress levels had already had an effect when he reached his driveway. In situations like this, Brad's therapist had advised him to go to his happy place. He remembered that earlier in the day and thought the time might be right for that. He was going to the fortress. That was his happy place. Once inside, he loaded a few changes of clothes, his laptop, and a basket of medication and got into his car. The fortress is located in a new light industrial district on the east side of Interstate 75, away from the possible storm surge of a hurricane. It has been advertised as the Executive Caverns. Surrounding the building is an intimidating fence and a heavy-duty electronic entry system. The long, one-story windowless concrete buildings had roll-up garage doors and steel doors for six separate units. Brad used the remote to open the roll-up door and entered a large room. Brad's 1,500-square-foot room had a concrete floor, a small bedroom, a bathroom with shower, and a kitchenette. 
There were couches, chairs, and tables in a large area with a 72-inch television mounted on the wall in the center. The concrete wall was decorated with pennants, posters, and flags of the University of Florida Gators and the Tampa Bay Buccaneers team. The posters depicting nude women on the back of the soccer posters changed depending on who was in attendance. The center of his attention in this modern man cave was a 1999 Mercedes SL500 convertible. It was a gleaming silver two-seat R129 Roadster. His baby girl was sheltered and sitting nose-to-nose -nose with the Lexus he had just escaped Molly in. Molly, oh yeah, he thought, looking through the numerous messages that had made his phone feel like a bag of angry bees for the last half hour. For the first time in two days, he smiled at the thought of Molly. They'd been good together, but times were changing. He was an engineer by training and inclination. On the wall hung a whiteboard for keeping track of bets, wagers, and sports results, and he figured it would come in handy. He cleared the whiteboard of past games played before his heart attack. It seemed that ten years ago he had been a vigorous man with a faithful wife, but only three days had passed. Now he called the whiteboard Molly's Numbers. There were four columns labeled, I'm sorry, I love you, please forgive me, I'll do whatever it takes, and blah, blah, blah. The last column read, How many people know? He chuckled as he watched phrases from the cheater's book of excuses appear in Molly's phone calls and texts. He thought, The more people cheat, the more it all sounds the same. He couldn't remember how many of those phrases had been used since he'd first learned of her infidelity. So he started the tally with this evening's fiasco. I'm sorry. 9. I love you. 15. Please forgive me. 8. Whatever it takes. 12. Blah, 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 blah. 1. The How Many People Know column had an increasing number, starting with two, Eric and Molly. The next three children and their spouses made up the number seven. Carrie's three friends and the hospital nurses made up 13. And finally, the three couples from that night brought the total to the 19 he knew of. How many more were there? He was glad Molly had given such a detailed account of how she'd had fun with the world's greatest lover. Yeah, that's right. Pandora put on Frank Sinatra. That was the music he wanted to hear as he put away his clothes and took his evening medication. A strong man, doing things his own way, living life to the fullest, despite having had a few painful relationships. He came out a winner, and that is how he will build his life now. The next morning, he woke up rested and calm. Calm didn't really fit the description of his cell phone, though. Good thing the whiteboard made it easy to erase and replace new numbers. As he was enjoying his morning coffee, there was a knock on his door. He thought, how the hell did she get through the gate? When he looked through the peephole, all he saw was a police cap. When he opened the door, he saw a young policeman and a female police lieutenant. Are you Brad Carson? Yes, ma'am, me. May I come in, Mr. Carson? Brad opened the door fully and invited the officers in. It was hard to see any bodily features of the female officer, except that she was blonde, tall, and without makeup, her face was attractive. The officers entered and took a quick look around the cave. I'm Lieutenant Pauls, and this is Officer Sullivan. Your wife called the police station last night and asked them to put out a silver alert for you. She thought you had another heart attack while driving and couldn't get home. We don't put out an amber alert or silver alert without doing an investigation. After questioning her, we thought you might be here. So, Mr. Carson, how are you feeling? Do you need any medical attention? Brad grinned and said, I'm not having a heart attack, I'm having a heartbreak. My wife had an affair while I was recovering from a heart attack four months ago. I needed to get out of the house and de-stress. Nonetheless, thank you for checking up on me. Lieutenant Pauls replied, No problem, just doing our job. Turning to leave, she said, Oh my God, is that a roadster? I just love that car. What year is it? 1999 with only 92,000 miles on it. It's beautiful. The car isn't even half disassembled yet. Can I sit in it? Brad caught a glimpse of her graceful athleticism as she slid into the car. Her eyes sparkled, and her smile betrayed her happiness as she gripped the steering wheel. Running her hand over the dashboard, she sighed and stepped out of the Mercedes. Thank you for the pleasure of touching your car. It was fun. Stepping right up to him, she handed him her card and said, Give me a call if you need anything, and I'm glad you're not in trouble. 
From the way she was acting, Brad realized he was going to need that card very soon. He wrote to Molly, You didn't tell me you were doing four months, so why should I tell you I'm doing one night? He scheduled a mid-morning meeting with his attorney to have time to make corrective actions at the bank and investment companies afterward. Brad spoke calmly and measuredly about his grief to his attorney, Joe Smith. Joe and Brad had been friends and golf partners for many years. After exposing his open wounds, Brad asked, Is divorce as bad for my finances as it is for my heart? It's a good thing you've had great legal help over the last 15 years, he said with a smirk. Not knowing what we did at the time, what we did before will protect you, my friend. Remember after that accident you were in, we put all your assets except the house into a trust? We were all terrified that if anything happened to you, the sole shareholder the company would suffer at the hands of the IRS. I even got Molly to sign an affidavit transferring all the shares in your company to a trust. The same goes for the divorce. Of course, we need to make some changes to the trust. You'll still be the trustee, but we'll change the beneficiary name from Molly to you. We won't name her in the trust. Son Jonathan will become your co-trustee with powers only after your death. Next, we will change your will specifying how you want the trust assets divided. As you said, one-third will go to Jonathan, one-third to Matthew, and one-third to Carrie's children under 25. Education expenses will be covered from age 18. What do you want to do with Molly? Your house isn't in a trust, and I don't know what you want to do with it. Of course, you'll probably have to pay Molly's spousal support for several years. What are your thoughts? Brad replied, I took care of the house. I fund a self-directed IRA to the maximum each year for her retirement. How much child support do you think I have to pay? I don't know. We'll see what Molly and the judge think. For now, we need to do some strategic planning. I assume you're going to start closing and transferring checks, savings, and credit cards today? Also, we need to print and sign an amended trust and will before you file for divorce. We need to do all of this in the right order to speed up the settlement process. It is very fortunate that we executed this trust several years ago. Financially, you are doing fine. It's unfortunate that your marriage didn't work out so well. After taking care of closing and transferring business, he stopped by the grocery store to pick up the necessary supplies for his man cave turned home. Since it was a beautiful fall day, he lifted the roll-up garage door to freshen the air inside. He was looking forward to this weekend. The fortress has six buildings, and holiday parties are always fun. Gas grills are laid out in the driveways and water tanks are filled with ice and beer. Nearly all of the other cave owners displayed their school's flags on Saturday and NFL flags on Sunday. The SEC rivalry games were the best times as the fans were extremely loyal and a lot of fun in that environment. He knew he wouldn't be alone when his life changed. He looked forward to spending more time in his SL500, which was certainly an eye-catcher. Rolling his eyes, he saw how many more messages and calls appeared on his cell phone. Regardless of the source, almost all the subjects of correspondence were in the same four columns on his whiteboard, and he saw no need to respond. One message was different from the others. It was from Carrie, begging him to call her. Yielding to Carrie's request, he called her, hoping the call would go to voicemail. No such luck, Carrie answered. Hi, Daddy. After greeting her, Carrie began to tell him, Daddy, you have to call Mom. She's out of her mind with grief, anger, and regret. She's afraid someone will find you dead from another heart attack. Can you call her, please? Brad thought, I think I'll file this under blah, blah, blah. Okay, Carrie, what do you want me to say? Molly, I'm sorry you were worried about me. You didn't worry about me enough to stay out of that asshole's bed for four months. Why worry now when I'm getting better? Is that what you want me to tell Carrie? Come on, Dad, she made a mistake. Can you forgive her and get back together? So she had fun with another guy. You're a big enough man to brush that off. The likelihood of me brushing off a passionate moment is very slim. However, she has entertained this guy over 40 times in his office or home. This is not an in-the-moment event. She drove an hour to his house so he could entertain her. This is premeditated. This shows complete disrespect and lack of any concern for me. Why did you lie to your brothers and start this whole cuckold fiasco? Why did you disrespect your father so much? I am so disappointed in you. You stabbed me in the back at the most inopportune time in my life. My doctor tells me not to be stressed, and just talking to you puts me over the red line. The click was the last thing she heard from her father. She wondered, last for now or forever? Now she began to cry. 
Pandora, turn on Frank Sinatra. Brad spent the next couple hours cleaning and dusting his SL500. Even though his man cave was tightly closed, the car was still dusty. Besides, he had something to do and something nice to think about. Saturday was just what Brad needed to unwind. He called a few of his buddies to come to his unit at the fortress for a gator soccer game, steaks on the grill, and beer in a tank of ice. Of course, all five guys showed up because Brad was buying after all. Other condo owners stopped by to chat with Brand and or his buddies, as this was a very social event. Many of them knew about his heart attack and were happy to see him out and about. After six hours of talking, laughing, and yelling, Brad was exhausted. His buddies were going to go to dinner, but Brad excused himself, lay alone on the couch for the post-game show, and fell asleep. Three hours later, he got up and went to bed. On Sunday, Brad didn't invite anyone to the Tampa Bay Buccaneers soccer game. It was his day to walk around the other units and enjoy their hospitality. Like Saturday, he had to watch what he ate and drank, or rather, what he couldn't eat and drink. Nevertheless, the day was pleasant. It seemed to him that with his wife's dismissal, his social life would not suffer much. At the end of the day, he was surprised that he didn't miss Molly at all. When she came to his squad for a game, she too worried about food, drinks, what she was wearing, who she was talking to, and where Brad was. She sucked all the fun out of an enjoyable day of camaraderie and good times. Monday was the big day when he met with Joe Smith to file the legal papers for the divorce. It was a sad time for him because he couldn't get over the fact that he had been cheated on by the woman he had loved for so long. It was time to call it a day. Instead of responding to Molly's hundreds of texts, emails, or phone calls, Brad texted her, Can we meet at the house Tuesday at 1 p.m.? Brad. Almost immediately, Molly replied, of course I missed you so much. It will be great to see you again. Can you come over at noon so we can have lunch? I'm sorry, I can't make it. If you change your mind, Brad, you can stop by any time that same day. Although Brad's message was cryptic, Molly hoped it would be the beginning of their reconciliation. She pondered what kind of dress to wear not slutty or provocative, but seductive to invite him to her and into their marital bed. Not for sex at the moment, but for intimacy. It would take a lot of negotiation and compromise to get Brad back into their home. She felt that they both needed to compromise and respect each other's feelings. She knew that no matter how he had behaved in the last week, Brad still loved her and wanted her to remain his wife. At 1.01 p.m. on Tuesday, Brad rang the doorbell of their home. He was quickly opened by Molly, who had been standing outside the door since 12.45. Molly tried to hug her husband, but he diplomatically sidestepped her as he headed for the family room. She happily placed the letter from the health department, stating that she had no sexually transmitted diseases on the table for Brad to review. I know it's faint comfort to you, but I wanted you to know that I'm clean. At her remark, he only shrugged and looked dumbly into her eyes as if to say, so what? Molly began the difficult conversation with questions about Brad's health. She was surprised when he told her about the parties he had attended over the weekend. I hope you didn't overdo it, Brad. You must remember to guard your heart. Brad thought, I had a heart attack, then she broke my heart. Now she's telling me to guard my heart. What a hypocrite. After they talked about their children and new grandchildren, Molly said, Since you've talked to her, Carrie has completely disintegrated. She was taking care of both of us because she loves both of us. She thought my therapy was appropriate. Well, her behavior was beyond what I considered acceptable on top of her disgusting advice to have fun with some jerk. Both boys thought your adulterous adventure was absolutely the wrong thing to do. Wrong in so many ways. I wonder how many other people think I'm the town coward now. What stories they tell in the bars. The dirty gossip my daughter spreads at my expense. I can't believe she'd do this to me. I'm sorry to hear about this and how the story spread. We tried very hard to be discreet so no one would find out or even think we were together. Brad snorted. So if I hadn't found out about your cheating from the phone call, you'd still be entertained by that asshole? I don't know, Brad. I haven't decided yet. My heart has always been with you, Brad. I really needed sex. I was going crazy and it was what my body needed. You weren't around, so I let myself relax a little. I knew you wouldn't approve, but I had to make a decision based on my needs, not your opinion. My body, my decision. I'm sorry you're angry but I made this particular decision, hoping you'd never find out about it. 
I did it for both of our sex lives, yours and mine. I wanted to be ready for you to come to bed and order me around. That's the way it's always been. That's the way it will continue to be. The fact that you found out about it created a stressful situation between us. I'm glad we were careful and I didn't want you to publicly embarrass yourself. That was never my intention. Your view of prudence and mine are different. By my count, there are 19 people today who know the whole story. You'd think you were showing it on the 6 p.m. news. How can this be? It can't be. Looking at Molly, he listed everyone on his whiteboard. Her face darkened as she looked at the floor. This couldn't help her negotiate. I'm sorry, Brad, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for a lot of things. I'm sure you have. By my count, you've said or texted me that 57 times since I left the house. Where has that gotten you? I'm so... I probably say it a lot because I'm really sore. I'm going to try not to say that word so often. Molly, you've also said 46 times that you would do anything to get us back together. So tell me your plan to get us back together. My main goal, Brad, is to grow old with you being the one and only main man in my life. You are a wonderful man, a great father, and I want us to enjoy grandchildren together. Knowing you as well as I do, you have explored all of our options. I have tried to offer you several options. The option you want to hear is to kick Eric in the balls and never see him again. Under normal circumstances, that's the best option for reconciliation. I'm willing to make that promise to you, but I don't feel I can remain faithful to you while you're incapacitated. It's hard for me to tell you this, but I want to be honest with you. Once you are allowed to have sex, I can guarantee that I will be faithful to you. Eric and all other men are no longer attractive to me. Like I said, Eric is a temporary replacement for the best lover in my life. Your treatment of me in the bedroom has made me a nymphomaniac. I just love having sex with you, but you're temporarily out of commission. I have it on good authority that in a few months you will be ready to thrill me to the skies. In the meantime, I suggest we give up on Eric. I need to have sex twice a week. That's two hours out of 168 hours in a week, or 1.1% of the week. That's not much by and large. The other 98.9% .9 of the week, I am your loving and grateful wife. You won't even know that I had sex with Eric, just like you didn't know I had sex with him for the past four months. You two were getting along great back then, weren't you? See, it's not that hard, is it? When your penis is resurrected and becomes fully functional, the dynamics change. When you can have sex once a week, I take one day away from Eric. When we can make love twice a week, Eric won't need to be around. You'll be my main and only man again. My last and least favorite option is to get a divorce. Least favorite because I won't be able to let you make exciting love to me anymore. I will miss you and the way you treat me as a wife and lover very much. The other downside is the financial aspects of the divorce. You've worked so hard and sacrificed so much for me and the kids. It would be a shame if I took half your company away from you. I would have to do that to maintain my lifestyle. I would keep my dream house and you would have to leave. Even if I keep the house, you would have the opportunity to come over and make love to me whenever you want. Besides, I'm sure you'd have to make monthly alimony payments. I'm sure the lawyers can work that out. The ultimate premise of each option is I love you and I want to stay with you. I feel like we can work it out if we both give in a little to make the other happy. Brad, I'm sure you'll want to make some changes, and I'm willing to change to make our marriage strong. You can think it over and we can talk about it now. We can take our time because it's important to both of us. As soon as she said the last words, Brad replied, Is that what I'll do anything to make our marriage happy means? It sounds to me like you're going to keep entertaining that bastard until you decide to quit. Molly stated emphatically, I absolutely hate that M word. It's rude, ill-mannered, and beneath your dignity to say it. Almost screaming, He's a bastard! So shut up with your moral outrage over my language, hypocrite. How can you judge me for the words flying out of my mouth when we're discussing the consequences of you having sex with that asshole? Molly blushed at his heated comments. He was right and she knew it, but she couldn't admit it in front of him. I can tell you've gotten some legal advice. Since I reviewed this with Joe, who we've been working with for years, you should have gone elsewhere. Yes, Eric's brother is a lawyer, and he gave advice on how divorce matters are usually handled. He was very helpful. Isn't that a little over the top? You were having fun for free physical therapy, and now you're having fun for legal work. You're really becoming a whore. 
Did that scuzzy lawyer keep the camera rolling while you were having fun so you can remember the tender moments after I get my manhood back? Don't say that, Brad. I'm trying to get us back together. Please, let's calmly try to make things right. Just for the sake of conversation, can you tell me what you think of our reconciliation? None of the nonsense you're going to subject me to. I don't know how much you've seen to come to that legal conclusion, but I think he's got the upper hand. Okay, Molly, I'm afraid you need a history lesson. Do you remember three years ago I was in a car accident? Right afterward, Joe recommended that we put all of my assets, except the house, into a trust. I was the trustee and you were the beneficiary. Well, that's all changed now. I'm both trustee and beneficiary. You are not listed anywhere in the trust. That's very appropriate since I've lost all trust in you. I now have complete control of the trust, and from your position, it is impregnable. I have also redrafted my will to specify how I want the trust distributed. One third each to Jonathan and Matthew. Carrie's children will get a third at age 25, and Jonathan will be the executor. Since I failed to recognize the whore you have become, you are no longer listed in my will. The blood rushed from her face and her hands became clammy. She was speechless. Let's talk about your dream house. The house I don't want or need, but you do. Two years ago, you persistently urged me to buy a Lamborghini convertible. You were very insistent, including denying me sex as punishment. Remember? There was no way I wanted to buy you an expensive Lamborghini, let alone brag about it to your friends. Your dream home was fully paid for and I arranged to refinance it. You and I signed a $900,000 mortgage on a $1,200,000 home. You took your $450,000, bought a Lamborghini, art for the house, and spent a month in Tuscany with your friends. That brings up a new question. It seems you couldn't wait two weeks after my heart attack to start having fun with someone else. So, new question. How many Italian women did you have fun with while you were in Tuscany? It hit Molly right in the forehead. She couldn't even grunt in response. She just hung her head. We had to give up the Lamborghini because you have no idea how to drive this spirited car. A fender bender on a Lamborghini costs a lot more than the Lexus I drive. After a combination of constant expensive car repairs, rising insurance rates, and speeding tickets, I convinced you to trade it in for a Mercedes sedan, losing over $100,000. You still have artwork in your house. It's yours. I don't want any of it. You never told me how much a villa in Tuscany costs for a month. Anyway, your share of the home refinancing is now in your entryway and on the walls, but you still owe $450,000. I took my $450,000 to buy a condo in the fortress and invested the balance, which today has almost doubled in value. That's something your lawyer won't be able to grasp either. You can take the house and stay in it as long as you make the payments. Good luck with that. If you want to own the whole house, not just half, I'll give you my half if you sign these papers within a week. Of course, then you'll have to pay my $450,000 mortgage payment. You won't get spousal support or alimony. I'm disabled, unable to work, and I don't have a clear doctor's opinion as to when I can return to work. My disability insurance policy is the only income I have. That's too bad, honey, but income-wise I'm poorer now than I was when I married you. As great as your sex with that bastard was, I'm sure this one will be remembered longer. I'm leaving your house, Molly. The divorce papers will be ready soon. Study them, hire a real lawyer, pay cash, not what you're used to. Brad left the envelope with the divorce papers, staggered briskly to the door, then turned and said, I had a heart attack that almost killed me. The pain and injuries were horrible, but I'm getting better every day. It's nothing compared to you breaking my heart. I'll never recover from that, but I'll damn well try. Walking to his car, he thought, what a difference a week makes. It seems like it was years ago, but it only took eight days to completely destroy my entire family. Court-ordered mediation was Molly's last hope for reconciliation. Brad used these sessions to quiet the hatred in his heart and soothe his soul. He didn't want to have another heart attack. There was too much to do as the best part of his life was coming up. He really didn't want to ever see Molly again. Brad and Carrie were never able to fully repair their relationship. Brad left the will intact and did not change the beneficiaries. Epilogue Molly's unsuccessful attorney tried to blow up the trust, but he wasn't versed in complex asset protection techniques. She had gone to another reputable firm, 
and they told her that what Brad had suggested was probably the best she could hope for. The fact that he had taken all these legal steps years before the divorce proved that he was acting in good faith at the time. Molly accepted Brad's offer to pay half the value of the house and the debt, then quickly sold the house. She has a small apartment in a safe neighborhood. Brad called a crew of movers to move his belongings out of the house and sent most of them to a storage unit or the fortress. He decided to wait until after the divorce to find a smaller apartment or house. He started coming to the office for an hour or two a day, but he refused to take a paycheck. Investments in his name alone gave him the cash he needed, but it was not considered income. At that time, Laura Miller, Director of Human Resources, was called to his office. As they were removing his belongings from his former home, he found an interesting folder. In it, he found a monthly report from a company that provided health insurance. Also in the folder was a pamphlet titled Sex and Physical Therapist. This report showed that Eric Adams sent a request to their company's health insurance company to pay for Molly's treatment at $1.100 a day for every working day of the week for five months. That's $2,000 a month that the company was paying Eric to entertain his wife. Over the past few months, Brad had learned to change his behavior. This time there was a devilish laugh instead of a scream. Molly wasn't there more than eight days a month. It was time to toast Eric's eggs. Laura had to gather and go through all the medical bills for him and Molly for the past five months. Eric had apparently decided that the medical bills from Brad's heart attack would so overwhelm the health insurance reporting that his $100 bills for sex would go unnoticed. Laura was shocked by the obvious health insurance fraud that Eric had committed with their company. Brad told her to have a representative from the insurance company check it all out. Upon checking the paperwork, the representative was furious. She said protocol was for them to contact Eric Adams first and have him explain and prove that his billing was accurate. If it was proven that it was not, he was to refund them $10,000 for five months of treatment. If they don't get paid, they will sue. Either way, he will be banned from participating in health insurance with all companies that give denials. Brad asked his attorney Joe Smith to contact the Florida Medical Board and ask them to review the sex and therapist brochure in regards to Eric Adam having sex with Molly Carson over 40 times. After further review and interviews with Eric and Molly, his license to practice physical therapy in the state of Florida was revoked. Molly was mortified at the way she was treated, as she had to detail what Eric did in each of these treatments. She felt like the men on the board were peeking at her and the women were looking at her with disgust. Brad got Joe to ask the local district attorney to bring a fraud case against Eric. As a favor to Joe, the DA filed charges but didn't prosecute him because $10,000 is a small amount of money in the underworld. Nevertheless, anyone who types Eric Adams' name into a search engine will see fraud charges. Brad hired a search company to check applications in other states in case Eric wanted to practice physical therapy there. A few days after the application was submitted, Joe Smith informed the new state of Eric's fraudulent and dishonorable activities. Because Brad was found to be disabled with little income, Molly had to return to the world of work. She didn't have time to take continuing education courses, so her nursing license was suspended. Her new profession was working as a nurse's aide at a local nursing home, a far cry from the life she had led at the country club. Her work schedule and reduced income prevented her from joining her ex-girlfriends at the country club pool for an afternoon drink of Cosmopolitans. Her divorced friends were so depressed by the news of her divorce that they started inviting her poor, lonely, soon-to-be ex-husband over for drinks and dinner. Their sons had little contact with her. Carrie and Molly blamed each other for alienating Brad and the boys. Both women were outraged that they had received very little property from Brad in the divorce. Brad laughed off Carrie's threat to deprive him of contact with his grandchildren. After an embarrassing interview with the medical board about her having fun with Eric, she cut off all contact with him. Neither Brad nor the kids know if she's seeing anyone, but that's hard to do when you work the night shift. Brad asked Joe if he could convince the DA to file prostitution charges against Molly. After all, she'd gotten treatment for $100 in exchange for sex. Goods and or services in exchange for sex was the definition of prostitution, but Joe doubted that it would succeed. Brad didn't care. At least the police came to her apartment to investigate the humiliating charges. After the divorce was finalized, Brad was also the subject of a police investigation. After a Sunday drive in his SL500 with Lieutenant Pauls, now known as Shelley, the investigation began. There were times that Brad found himself handcuffed to the bed. 
Brad is back to living life to the fullest. Numerous friends and acquaintances constantly set him up with his sisters, neighbors, friends, and co-workers. For over 30 years, he thought that Molly was the one and only woman for him. But it turned out she wasn't. He enjoyed interviewing to find a new one and only woman for himself. That's it. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed this story. Subscribe to my channel and watch the next video.